your higher version is out there right now. So what's the future you telling you right now? Future me telling me right now. Mm. Future me is telling me right now that we made it. And not from a celebrity point of view, but as a change maker, impacting. And I think that's the season I'm going into, impact. Being a female founder myself and a black female founder, it's not been easy. Life's experiences teach you different types of resilience. To somebody else, it might be being strong in the face of everything. But for me, resilience is showing that I'm having a bit of a challenge at the moment and I'm just trying to work out how to deal with it. Your educational journey is about you, your educational journey. Your child could be the next Bill Gates. Your child could be, you know, the next Elon Musk and you don't know it because you're trying to make them into a doctor. That's not what they were created to be. Yeah. Every single child comes to this earth with a gift. And our job as parents is to nurture that gift. Elaine, welcome to Open Up Podcast. I, um, I have to say I feel pretty privileged because... <laughs> I know that you don't say yes to everyone. So, oh, the like inner child in me is like super happy <laughs> that I got a yes. <laughs> oh my goodness. No, I had to say yes to you. I think that I love what you, what your values are and I love what you're trying to do. So I thought, why not come on here? You know, um, I think it will be nice for both of us. Oh, I love that. When I was thinking about this episode and really like, where do I want this conversation mm -hmm. to go? I mean, this is kind of going to lead into the first thing I say to you, but there's so many areas I would love for us to explore. But I'm also really about beautiful community and listeners being able to like take away one or two things. So we're going to see where the conversation goes. Okay. I've said to all my guests on season three so far, you know, I'm open for a part two in the future. OK, so we're not trying to cover your whole entire life story and experience. But I think there's a real mix for me here to bring out like parts of your story the parts that yes I know perhaps some of those that I don't but also like your experience because yes I focus on communication mm -hmm. and I just feel that a lot of parents that are going to listen to this episode mm -hmm. are going to get an insane amount of value from you when I look at you and I look at like the person sitting in front of me today I see this multifaceted, professional successful resilient person mm -hmm. have you always been that way do you even agree with that description <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> um, I think what I am now is not the person I was last year. Mm. It's not the person I was five years ago. And so I think that resilience is, is a layer by layer effect. It's not something that you just are. Um, life's experiences teach you different types of resilience. Um, and so... I might look like a very resilient person, but I have my moments where I'm just like, what is happening? Mm. You know, um, I think I, w when we initially met, I told you about the things that I'd gone through last year. And even just this year, you know, I was in a car accident six weeks, six months ago. And even just saying to myself every day, you can do this. Mm. Because I had days where I couldn't feel my legs. And that in itself makes me feel like, um okay where are we going with this you know and I have a son who two days later after I had the accident also had an accident at school and broke his ankle in two places had to have emergency surgery and so resilience I think is layer by layer and you learn different types of resilience um so resilience is not being strong in front of everybody it's not resilience is showing your vulnerability in that I'm in a place at the moment where I'm trying to navigate what's going on at the moment. It's okay. Mm. It's okay to give yourself grace. I think that's what resilience means to me. To somebody else, it might be being strong in the face of everything. But for me, resilience is showing that I'm having a bit of a challenge at the moment and I'm just trying to work out how to deal with it. And maybe my capacity today is to be happy and jokey with you. My capacity tomorrow is I'm going to have a chill down day where I'm just going to watch Disney Plus all day. Oh, my God, I'm here for Disney Plus. Right. Yes. Um, and I'm just 
I'm just trying to understand what I'm learning from this experience. That is what resilience is to me. So when you say to me, <laughs> I see a strong, resilient lady, I'm like, wow, really? Is that what I give off? Mm. But um, I think you wouldn't be the first person to say that. Somebody else has said that to me recently that said, my God, Elaine, you are really strong. And I'm like, okay, if that's what strength looks like to you. For me, for a long time, I used to see it as a weakness. But I realized that there's a scripture that, and I read a lot of scripture that says that you are made perfect in your weakness. Mm. And so I believe that in everything that happens to me that's supposed to make me weak, I'm actually getting stronger. So. Oh, I mean, yes, can I back that up? I also think you've raised such a beautiful point around like what resilience means to you. And mm -hmm. I do think, I remember actually like in lockdown running a workshop on this for a company and it was all about resilience. Mm -hmm. And I was like, guys, I'm just letting you know, this is how I'm going to run the workshop. And it, mm -hmm. I don't think it's about what you think it is. Mm -hmm. And they came at me really about it being about strength and where you get your strength from. And I was mm -hmm. like, it's interesting to hear how you describe it. And I guess my version of it is learning how to like adapt in the face of whether it's obstacles, adversity, mm -hmm. challenges, and how you're willing to then give yourself grace. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the things that I am noticing so deeply with my clients at the moment. Mm -hmm that when we look at the way they communicate, where they get frustrated with themselves, where they're cross that they didn't say something or they don't speak up or they're getting triggered again or they feel triggered, the thing that we're working so deeply on is learning how to give themselves grace but develop the self-compassion because they have it for other people. Mm. But actually, until we develop it for ourselves, is that that's the moment when your relationship with yourself changes, in my opinion. I totally agree with you and I think that a lot of these ideologies that we have about resilience come from what we've been taught by other people mm. and resilience for me is my definition and you have to take it or leave it. Yeah. That's my that's that's what I'm living with. And so if you come to me with resilience is strength well good for you but this is where I am right now and I think a lot of times the reasons why people come with Resilience is strength. Resilience looks like this. It looks like this. Is because this is what this is the narrative that we've been sold. Yeah. And so we have to conform to that narrative. Who, who told you that? That's oh. not true. Yes. Can we can we stop? Can we rewrite <laughs> the narrative? Can we remember that we're in charge? That honestly like brings me into I guess a beautiful segue. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're an education strategist. Mm -hmm. Please correct me if I say anything incorrectly because all I have at the moment is all your ti titles in my head and I'm like, am I going to do her justice? I'm like, please, God, please don't let me down here. <laughs> okay, so you're education and strategist, but can you just explain in your own words a little bit more around what that involves mm -hmm. and then I'm going to get into it because when you talk about, you know, that's a narrative that you don't have to buy into. You work with kids and... I feel like for our parents listening out there, we've got some key messages that are going to be so important for them to hear. Absolutely. I think for me, I started as an educational consultant, which is basically just, you know, helping parents find the right school for okay. their child. Um, the reason why I changed it to become a strategist is that education is about strategy. Mm. It's not just about the academics that you have. And I started looking at the whole child and the family unit to make sure that the educational choices were right to get the educational outcomes that you're looking for. And so when you're just a consultant, you're just like, well, go to this school, do this, do this, do this. And then you find yourself just sticking to a routine mm -hmm. that everybody else is doing. And so you're supposed to get that outcome. That doesn't always work, you know. So, yes, I might have to put my child back a year or I might have to let my child repeat a year in another school because that environment is better for them. That's where I come in now. Whereas before, every parent is like, well, his friends are in that class, so he's got, well, who told you this? Because when you get to university, nobody's asking you how old you are. Mm -hmm. When you get to the job force, nobody's asking you, when did you graduate? When did you do your GCSEs? I have a son that did his GCSEs at 10, yet he's 18, and because of the accident he had, he's not going to be applying for university. He's taking a year out. Life. Life is lifing, as they say. Mm. Right? So that's where I come in. And in, in I let parents see that your educational journey is about you. Your educational journey. It's got nothing to do with anybody else. And whatever school might tell you, you have to do this. You have. To, so why am I going to do A-levels when I've barely passed my GCSEs? You know what? I can rewrite those GCSEs. 
become better at them. Maybe I'm not even a GCSE candidate. Maybe I'm somebody that needs to go into performing arts. Maybe I needed an apprenticeship. Let's look at those different avenues. Because at the end of the day, my dad always says, it's not where you start, it's where you finish. And a lot of times parents are looking at this end result. And a lot of times they are giving a certain narrative to children when yes. they're not letting the children discover who they are and who they are meant to be. Because a lot of times, especially with the community that I'm from, like African parenting. Let's just say it. African parents, hey, guys, we love you, but sometimes you make it hard it's for us. It's a lot. Well, it's a lot. I'm not going to lie. It's a lot. Like, <laughs> you have to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, you know, all of the above. That's it. Investment banker. That's it. Yeah. If you're not any of that, you're not a serious person. Like, that's not true. Mm. You know, and now that the world has changed as we know it, there are so many ways of making money. Your Your child could be the next Bill Gates. Your child could be, you know, the next Elon Musk. And you don't know it because you're trying to make them into a doctor. That's not what they were created to be. Yeah. Every single child comes to this earth with a gift. And our job as parents is to nurture that gift. You know, there was a story I read about a famous footballer. I'm not going to mention the name. Okay. But there was a story I read about a famous footballer. And um, he used to just kick all the time, like kick doors. Kick. And... Everybody was like, oh, this child is a troublemaker. One teacher didn't see it as him being a troublemaker and said, go outside, kick a ball. Now that one, now that footballer is one of the greatest that we know. But that's because somebody identified what looked as like a problem, but it was actually a gift. And so a lot of times when we see children that talk a lot, maybe they're meant to be a debater. <gasps> maybe they're meant to be an MP. Yes. Maybe they're meant to be an activist, speaking up for people who can't speak for themselves. And so let's stop doing this. Let's stop saying you talk too much or you do this too much. Or and I always say to parents, what does your child do a lot that irritates you? That's their gift. Oh, there is. Oh, my God. I literally just want to pick up on like, I want to interrupt you after every single <laughs> sentence. Th there's so many reasons. The first thing is, OK, I predominantly work with adults, right? Mm -hmm. I hope at some point as the business grows in the future that it will full circle back to kids mm -hmm. because I really believe that we don't have a lesson at school where actually if we really truly learn and understood how we communicate, understand the relationship with ourselves and how we talk to ourselves, mm -hmm. it is going to deepen the relationship. Yes, how you feel about yourself and the people around you. Mm -hmm. So one part of it is like changing and shifting the narrative. I'm going to throw loads at you right now because there's mm -hmm. too many thoughts in my head, all right? One is around, all right, the stigma around age. Mm. And so you're talking about it as well from an educational perspective. Mm -hmm. Even now, it's so funny listening to you. It's not funny at all. But I'm uh, noticing and being aware that you're talking about the conversations you've had with parents and if they need to put their kid back a year or repeat a mm. year. My body cringed because inside, that's still the stigma of like, oh my God, it's the like subconscious level of your going backward. Mm -hmm. Also the deep African upbringing in me, right? And it's like, that's one point, but also that links into like so much of when I work with my clients in different aspects, but age again, like who said at any point that your life was supposed to be figured out at 30? Like, why do you have to be married and why do you have to have kids, oh right? And even like one of my other guests earlier was really around like turning a pro athlete at 27. Like that's not supposed to happen, You're right? You're supposed I'm to be a pro off. athlete at 18. Yeah. It's Mad. Exactly. So there's so much that you're saying. I'm like, oh my God, we need to talk about this and we have to talk about this. And But also the messaging when you say as well, there's a beautiful, this is such an old podcast I listen mm -hmm. to, but it's Greg McCowan, who's the author of Essentialism. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure he was talking to Jay Shea and he was talking about his kids and the relationship with them. And I can't remember... I mean, it must have been around purpose because that's what Jay Shetty mm. really focuses on. Mm. But when you say, what's the thing that irritates as a parent? What irritates you about mm. your child? Mm. Because that's their gift. And he was saying his kids were still really young. And he said, if you stop and you pause and you look at what they're doing, you will start to notice already where their gifts lie. And I am so deeply passionate about this because... I've said this before on a different podcast that mm. I went to uni. At no point in any part of my upbringing mm -hmm. did I think about not going to uni. Because it's a given. Yes. And the thing is, I also say equally in another breath, I had the best uni experience. Like mm -hmm. I truly did. But why is it taking me 12 years to 
to create my own business because I didn't think it was an option. Wow. And even going back to like the gifts and being able to nurture it and something I talk a lot about, everything you say is like, I'm like, yeah, this is what I work with my <laughs> clients, right? But the, when you say, can we stop? Can we stop labeling them? Can we stop saying you're the troublemaker? Mm -hmm. So I was always the bossy one. But yeah, why that just I, means that you're a leader. I think, why did I spend 12 years arguing with every boss in my corporate life? Actually, I am... You were never meant to work <laughs> for anybody. <laughs> I am the same. <laughs> and and do you know what's really strange? I remember one of my friends said to me at school, mm. I think I must have been about eight, I said, I will never work for anybody. Oh, I used to say the same. I will never work for anybody. <clears throat> and so why was I then... It was before I became Elaine. I was a dentist. I went into dentistry. Okay. And after about a year of being on the dentistry course, I was like, <laughs> this is not what I want to do. Um, and then I moved to chemistry with management. And um, I remember one of my uncles saying to me, typical African, right? Okay. I'm I love Africans, <laughs> but he was like, what are you going to do with chemistry with management? And I was like, well we'll cross that bridge when we come to it mm. and then to make everybody happy i started doing an acca course okay just so that i could tick those boxes you know you know give my parents bragging rights because my brother was doing law with economics oh my god stop the bragging rights i can't deal with and uh, i think that if i had done what i am doing now which is following my passion but then sometimes go on life takes us through certain journeys for us to understand who we're meant to be I agree. because i think that if i'd gone into what i'm doing now i really wouldn't understand why i'm doing it mm. you know and so i went through what i went through and then i got to a place where i became the rhetoric that i didn't want to become a single mother raising two children two black boys in particular yeah. and that's when i started i was like okay so why why is there this stereotype about single black mothers you know and that's what made me start looking at education okay education is a standard it's a given but now i've gotten to a stage where my children are, one is definitely going to university the other one is like i'm not going to university and he's been saying it since he was about 14 and i'm like okay we're not going to force this issue mm. we're going to look at other ways of making you become who you're meant to be nice you know um and i've had to change that way of thinking because obviously when he said to me i want to be an actor the african in me has yes. gone are you crazy do you know how much money i've spent on you over the past couple of years <laughs> um you have to go to university and i find that even when my my father speaks he says things like you know don't worry he's going to go to university in it because that's what we know yeah but the world in which we live in and i've said it before has changed and that somebody can go on to start their own business at the age of 16 and become a multimillionaire by the time they're 21 and nobody's asking them what degree they got i'm just and sad that wasn't me okay like i missed my timeline and the <laughs> thing is you can go to you can go to business school you can go yeah. to university at any age i remember being at university and being in, on the same course with somebody who was 58 mm. and i said why are you on this course because in my mind it's young people that go to university she said i'm bored i just want something to do so you're going to sit on this course for three years get a a bachelor's because you're bored each to their own mm. but she'd caught the vision early in that i've done all of those things this is what i really want to do and yes. i think that when we get to a place where children are actually doing what they really want to do we won't have so much so many people dropping out of university so many people being depressed at university and that the experience that they get at university will be more um about learning and and and, and enjoyment rather than i'm getting drunk every night yeah and all of those things are fine because that's where you find yourself at university but not a lot of people actually really enjoy the experience of a university and as much as you and i can both sit here and say yeah i loved university i got lots of friends but if we actually and i'm going to use a term that a lot of my um <laughs> my cousins use if we actually deep it <laughs> i was waiting for it <laughs> we actually deep it half the time you were like let me just get there on time let me just how have i got a lecture at nine o'clock like i can't get up at nine o'clock and you know little things like that but that's life you know, um, I remember my son asking me, I think two days ago, he said, okay, so 
when I go to university, um, after I've gone to my lectures and I've done a bit of my writing, what do I do then? I said, but you read a degree in university, so you best get yourself to the library and start reading up on stuff because they leave you to do a lot of independent work. Yeah, that was my biggest shock. Yeah. That was like my huge shock to that system. Mm. D- tell me from your opinion because you're in this sector and like this is your area mm. of expertise but having gone through it for me that jump from like a levels to university and also actually i had very minimal teaching mm. i don't think i had more than an hour per module mm. per week which i think we just did three or four a year that's it if we were lucky we would get a seminar which would actually be where you'd put it into practice and I did law, so like there was a hell of a lot of reading. I think it's probably now like you know when you look back and you're like, yeah, life takes you through different phases mm. and pop. Like I have skill sets from there that honestly are yeah. godsend now, and I'm just, I'm like, okay, Absolutely. thank you, I will take that. But the teaching time, because also I had gone through like my educational system. Everything was, this is how it is. Take this, take this, take Do this, it. learn this. But you don't get that in university. Mm -mm. And the other thing I realised in university was I was very popular at school. Everybody knew me. And then you get to university, nobody knows you. Nobody cares who you are. Do you turn up for the lectures, sign the form, take the handouts? If you can understand what the lecturer is saying, great. great. If you can't, you better go and find out in the library. And I think that in we need to take this back to school where we begin to teach children independent study. And that's where the independent schools and the state schools, there's a huge divide because there is a lot of, um, they do lead you, but then they lead you to search for things yourself and to to in, I, I engage in outside of just academia. Whereas in state school, it's like, we got to get the mark. We And even in grammar school and even in academies, whatever you want to call it, if you're not paying for it, you're not getting all of those extracurriculars. Let's be let's call a spade a spade yeah. and let's be really clear. And that um, you know, lots of academies say, Oh, we, we got better results than the private school down the road. Well, good for you. But you know the private school down the road has got more network. That's gonna help them later on in life. And if we look at who's running the country, if we look at who's running governments, if we look at who's running the globe. They're not people who went to the school down the road. Mm. You know, they're people that went to certain establishments and they've got certain network of friends. Let's be very clear about that. Um, yeah, I think I think that in terms of the, the jump from school to university, I think there's not enough preparation mm. um, for children to... Re- even the jump from GCSE to A-level, there's not enough preparation because A-level is when you begin to think like somebody at university that's when you choose your subjects this is what i really want to do yeah and and you get a shock if you don't get the grades that you want yeah you get a shock wow i did get the grades and i worked hard because some courses are just about regurgitating information but a lot of what a level is about now is the application of the knowledge that you've been given Mm. so the teachers will be there and they'll say right because they've got just got to get through the work they've just got to get through the curriculum and so at the end it's like okay, what am I supposed to do with this? And I was quite fortunate, or fortunate, unfortunate, I'm not really sure, but I missed um, my university offer by a couple of grades. Okay. And so I had to go to a sixth form college, which was a a hot house, basically. You were not doing any extra, you were just literally trying to get that grade and moved on. Okay. And so there, that's where we were taught about exam technique. We were taught about, understanding when you read the question how to skim read all of these things that they don't teach you in school Mm. but these are the things that help you pass an exam yeah and so i remember that you that college was only for people who were applying for medicine dentistry or veterinary science and they only did four subjects biology chemistry physics and math that's all you're doing all day every day pass papers learning the material to pass the exam and I don't think we had many holidays. I remember being at school at Easter. We only had Easter Sunday off, but Good Friday we were at school. But that's because we needed to get that grade. And mm. so you need to be able to show people that if you really want that grade, these are the hours that you have to put in. If you want to become a tennis player that is 
the GOAT, yeah. greatest of all time, yeah. <laughs> there's certain hours that you have to be putting in. I really agree with this, okay? Like, I massively, deeply agree with this. And I've had similar conversations before where I truly believe if you want to be the best in whatever it is that you mm -hmm. want to do or, you know, you want to cultivate, then it's a different level of focus and dedication and being able to adapt and navigate those struggles and those obstacles. Mm -hmm. I do think it takes a different type of person that is willing to mm -hmm. sacrifice what perhaps, you know, like, as a society we deem to be enjoyable in mm -hmm. our free time, right? Mm -hmm. I massively ag agree with that. And I'm all for it, because I sit on that end of the spectrum, okay? Mm -hmm. However, the fact that you have worked with kids and families for such a significant period mm -hmm. of your life, uh, is it a question or observation? I'm not sure, I'm gonna throw it out, we'll mm -hmm. see where it goes, okay? okay? My, especially as we touch on like African upbringing and mm -hmm. that, whew, the expectation, I am conscious would I say I worry? I am mm -hmm. conscious of like how we nurture young people, our kids, mm -hmm. whoever's listening, whatever relates to you, in order for them to be themselves, mm -hmm. to cultivate the independent study and just their independent thinking. Like one thing I think I work so deeply with my like adult clients on mm -hmm. is learning to trust themselves. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to trust ourselves because for the biggest period of our life where we're developing, we're told what to do. So of course you're, any time as well that I'm generalizing, but for the purpose of this conversation, when you do speak up and you get told no, or you realize that it's not okay, or mm. it's not safe for me to speak up, I'm not talking as well about like a physical abuse environment, mm. then of course your brain is gonna start recognizing mm. it's not safe for me, I don't trust myself, well I shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like, how do we get this balance between allowing them to find themselves, be independent, be authentic, mm -hmm. strive and be your best mm -hmm. for you, whoever, whatever that best looks like, mm -hmm. without the like insane expectations and pressure that I think comes with it. I think that, and I was a parent coach and I still am a parent coach for okay. a long time. Um, I think that what is really important is that we lead as parents from a place of fear and also from where we were brought up. Oh my God, yes. So what happens is when you become a parent, there are certain things that you have to change. You have to redefine your thinking. Let me give you an example. <laughs> so my son wanted to go out to a party. And obviously the African in me was like, why, why, why do you want to go to the party? <laughs> But I was like, I had vowed that I would never be that parent. So I had to get the balance right to show him that I trusted him. Mm. So he was going to the party in Sussex. And so I was like, okay, Sussex is about an hour and a half away from us. Yeah, I was you're like, not, not around the corner. Not around the corner, and you're not getting in the train. So I'll pay for an Uber to take you there and pick you up. What time will you finish at the party? Because what I didn't want to say is, well, you have to be home by nine. Mm. Because we all know that nine o'clock is when the party is starting. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, what time do you want the cab to come and get you? And then there was a bit of negotiation with the time. In the end, he said, oh, the cab should come and get him at 11, which meant that he'd be at home about 12.30. And obviously I'd be sitting there worrying, but why do I need to worry if I've organized yeah. and, I've, and, and, I've, and I've showed him that I've trusted him? In the end, he called me at 10 and said, oh, mommy, can you tell the cab to come and get me? Because everybody's gone now, so I don't want to be here on my own. I was like, okay, fine. Got the cab. But after doing that about three or four times, he began to realize that I trusted him. Do you know what's really strange? I let him go without even taking the number of a parent. So I was thinking, I've let my child go, mm -hmm. and I've not even been responsible enough because in the bid to show him how much I trusted him, yeah. I, I didn't do what parents normally do, which is... <laughs> I need to know who's going to be there. Please, blah, blah, blah. So I remember I'm that I did... bet them as well. Yeah. I did send him a text and I was like, when you get there, take a picture with you and your friend so I know that you're there. Yeah, nice. You know, that's... Yeah. You know, I'm still being a parent. It would be very irresponsible of me to go, well, you just get on with it. Mm. You know, because I still think that in... in As children get older, our parenting style changes and I need to be able to let him realise that I trust him and that I've raised him up in such a way that he can make decisions on his own mm. and what you said about we are told for a long period in our time 
um, what to do, when to do it, how to do it. So you find that those type of children, when they get to interviews, they can't function because there's no independent thinking. Yeah. So I think that very early on, you let children to begin to make decisions, example. And this is an analogy that I use whenever I'm teaching about um, choices and consequences, you call it. So I'll say, you know that you want the child to put on a coat. Mm. So you say, do you want the red coat or the blue coat? You're giving the child a choice. Mm. So then they begin to understand that I have, I'm in a safe space where I can have choices. Nice. Um, and listen, you're always going to get that point when they're a teenager, when they're trying to figure out who they are in the world, where there's going to be pushback. But you as a parent have got to lead by example. So you arguing back with the child. What are you teaching the child? Oh my God, I say this all the time, like so deeply, because how it then manifests into adulthood, whether it's in a professional mm -hmm. environment, whether it's in a relationship, you will repeat what you're so used to. So, okay, cool. Shh, shh. I'm not necessarily saying that we all are never going to react to something, mm -hmm. but the more we shout or the more you disregard them and give them silent treatment, like take whatever end of the spectrum you want to come at mm -hmm. it from. I don't mind. It's going to manifest in a few different ways mm -hmm. and either when you use the example of interview, but you won't, you won't go for the, the interview. You won't go for the promotion. You won't want to mm -hmm. raise your hand in the meeting and say, oh, one more thing from my side mm -hmm. to add. You won't say it in an assertive way. You'll undermine what you're mm -hmm. saying because either someone shouted at you. So anytime you've tried to express something, mm -hmm. you feel that actually intrinsically now it's wrong. Yeah if you want to go deeper than that, that is also going to affect your limiting beliefs yeah. around that of I'm not good enough. I don't deserve it. Yeah. I'm not worthy, Absolutely. but we'll park that for now. So also, yeah, whether it's the shouting at them or whether it's the, the dismissing of what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And I, I know probably I'm speaking from a perspective. I also don't have kids yet. So if any parents are listening, like, wow, she's going in. Like, I'm not saying it's an easy job. I truly yeah. don't believe it is. And without me having kids yet, mm -hmm. I also do believe that it's possibly one of the hardest jobs it is absolutely and i think that parents can never compare themselves to another parent mm. so what might work for me may not work for you and i also think that being a parent of a zero to five year old is very different from being a parent who's 16 to 19. it's a different it's a different journey altogether and i, I i'm just like Whew. and if you're a parent with more than one child every child is different oh. God, I cannot say amen to that <laughs> enough because I don't think, like from a society point of view, mm -hmm. that even we necessarily identify that and that is okay that if you had two kids or five kids, that each of them's different. I always see it, well, maybe I see it now, that's a lie I've always seen it mm -hmm. this way, but just in the order that they come out of your womb makes them different because Absolutely. the eldest versus the youngest is going to get a different experience. Absolutely. And I just have, I think if you can start from that space and have an appreciation of that, then how you nurture them as they grow, they're going to have different needs. Yeah. And I guess for me, it's such an important part because like your needs then determine like your communication and how that leads into adulthood massively, right? That is very true. Very, I love the analogy of even depending on the order in which they come out and, and actually looking at my own two children, I can very much tell th the one that came first is very you know he just get on with it mm. and the second one is always about trying to just make sure that his space is is heard what he has to say is listened to because he for a very long time he was the youngest grandchild oh, wow. and and now obviously there's three after him but he still feels that in our family in our family not the general family but in our particular nucleus family yeah he he feels like nobody's listening to me so I have to scream for people to hit, listen to me. So I even said to him the other day, why are you shouting? Mm. He said, because nobody's listening to me. And then I had to sit down and say to myself, maybe I haven't been listening to this child like how I listened to the other one. Yeah. And so listening can look like so many different things. So to him, listening could be me sitting down and looking at him like I'm looking at you. Whereas with the other one, I can be busy doing so many other things, but he still knows I'm listening. Yes. But to him, his listening, he needs to believe that you're listening to him and you heard what he said and you're not just reciting something that you think you heard. So with him, I've had to just be very different. I'm, okay, so what is it that you want to do? Mm. Do you want to do this? And, and, and with him, I've had to realise that 
life is not as cut and paste like how it was. Not even with my oldest child, it wasn't like that with him, but with what I was taught. Yeah. You know, um, and that we go through things and we have to adapt with the narrative that we've been fed. And that the narrative that we've been fed may not be the right one for our particular circumstance at that time. And learning to go through life so different. I think my thinking when I was 20 and my thinking now, without giving away my age. (laughs) um, You don't have to disclose. (laughs) It's totally different. Mm. Totally, totally different. I was speaking to a friend of mine and we were talking about BBLs. Very interesting topic. (laughs) And I was just like, why do people do things like that? Like, you know, you can't sit down for about five or six weeks. And she's like, yeah, why don't we just go to the gym? And she said, you know what it is? Instant gratification. (laughs) And also when you're younger, those are the things that excite you. When you get older, you're just like, BBL for what? I feel like you need to also define BBL, please. (laughs) For the people, not everyone is going to understand that acronym. Resilient butt lift. Thank you. Um... I just look at it like Mm. it's not really on my agenda. My agenda is to raise leaders for the next generation, to give people hope where they felt they haven't had hope before. Um, And people who've been told no, why have you been told no? You can always define where you want to be. Who said you can't be there? Who said you can't be this person? Where did you get that rhetoric from? Let's prove them wrong. You know, for me, I'm, I've always been that person. Is when people say you can't do something, oh, really? Okay, I'll find a way. Yeah. I'll find a way. There's something similar about my guests on this season. You'll have this fire in your belly, right? <laughs> now, I mean, there's so many other things I want to sh- like you to share with us. I'm not going to attempt to try and go into them all, but I think one other area that I am so keen for us to kind of like delve into Mm -hmm. I'm trying to like prioritize in my head okay Okay. but we've got like such a beautiful insight I think into like your educational side of you I guess that facet I'm gonna Mm -hmm. say the thing that you do because it doesn't make you who you are I'm very keen on like less differentiate (laughs) but it's part of your life um there's also a lot of other things that you do that you're involved in in terms Mm -hmm. of businesses and charities something that I know that also is a huge part is in terms of when you say as well lead, raising leaders for the next generation mm-hmm. and specifically when we talk about female founders mm-hmm. and business so I guess first of all tell us a little bit more around like your focus in it and how you're involved in that kind of aspect okay so there are two aspects that I'm involved in one is one that's very passionate and um, I'm very passionate about or one that um, has I've had it in my belly for about seven years But in the passing of my mother and my grandmother, I believe it's something that needs to come out now. And it's funny, I never knew what to call it. I always used to call it the educational fund. And I'm like, who calls their stuff that? (laughs) But, you know, um, I'm working on a two things. The first one is a foundation called the Antiba Foundation, which is named after my mother. And that looks to pay the school fees of children in this country to go to the best institutions, um, to go to to the best universities and to build the best networks to become the African leaders of the next generation. Right? Oh, amen. I know. <laughs> it's a big job, trust me. And you know what? Since I've decided that I'm going to put it out there, the number of people that have started phoning me and going, Elaine, we want to be involved. How are we going to be involved? And I'm just like, well, this is what I asked for how many years ago? And is coming to fruition i'm going to interrupt you there because i just want to put in a side note and say you asked and you received you also said seven years ago for my beautiful listeners divine timing okay (laughs) so like i'm very on my manifesting at the moment right but i've just done a workshop so it's also you asked right and that okay sometimes we should surrender sometimes things will come back as and when they should but also when you asked people other people responded or the universe responded i believe in yeah. or god however you want to say it but i just needed to put that note in so please continue no i totally agree with <laughs> you and so um i also sit on an advisory board for girls in stem education um in ghana um because i loved the concept about girls coding um i was a science freak at school so um and i believe that in Ghana and in Africa, it's not something that's really pushed. Girls in 
well, in any kind of education you need, mm. um, where a girl's place is, you know, in the kitchen giving birth to children. Um, yeah, I love you all Africans, but that's what the narrative was before. Yeah. And we are changing it. Yeah. Um, and so I sit on there to drive that that element of change. And so we've got our first project that's out, which is building a coding lab in a container. We've got that one out in a Methodist school in Ghana. And we're looking at doing our next project. We can do about 10 around the country of Ghana. We want to replicate that in the continent of Africa. So that's, you know, one and two are basically, th it's almost the same, but not quite the same thing because they involve young people. Mm. In terms of female founders, one thing I do a lot of is mentoring um, other females who who come to me go with an idea and I'm like, okay, so how are we going to turn this, how are we going to monetize this? Because mm -hmm. you can't be doing stuff for free unless I know you won the lottery for like 600 million days. <laughs> <laughs> you can be doing that philanthropy <laughs> work, yeah? But um, if you want to turn this into something that can actually one day even float on the stock exchange, everything started from a concept. And the difference between you and the person that's floating on the stock exchange is they had a plan. Mm. And this is one thing I say all the way through, even with parents that come to me, what's the plan? What's the end result? What are you looking for? Mm. So if you work with me, in six months, what do you want to see? Because then I understand your expectation of me. Yes. So I do a lot of female mentoring. And um, being a female founder myself and a black female founder, it's not been easy. But one thing I have always made sure of, and I make sure that anybody who works with me is, you're not going to, like, everybody's going to remember you in that room for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons. Um, and 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 I think that that starts with, like you said, believing in yourself. Mm. And a lot of times we've been taught not to be seen, not to be heard, just to work in the background. Oh, my God, yeah. And so when I start working with people, I use a lot of the techniques that I use for children. But the same things work on adults because these are self-limiting beliefs. These are self-esteem issues. Well, why do you think like that? Who told you this? Mm. You know, and and thing is, I've had to work through that myself as well. But in working through it, I can I can see the diamond in somebody who comes to me as coal, and I can begin to rub that off, and we can begin to work it with each other for them to become the diamond that they're meant to be. I, maybe just, I should call my found my mentorship diamonds i don't know i was just gonna say could you have given us any more of a beautiful visualization i'm a really visual person so like i deeply deeply appreciate it that was beautiful i mean if you do call your foundation that and you've just come up with it i'm gonna be super happy <laughs> um one thing i guess before we kind of wrap up mm -hmm. is looking back on when you were first starting out as a black female founder mm -hmm. what's one thing you would I'm thinking, do I want to put it in this way? I'm going to. What's one thing that you would like to have told, like, that younger version of you? Oh, I think I was asked this question recently. Oh, my gosh. No, I don't like that. Maybe I need to re come up with a different one. <laughs> and I, do you know what? I? The only thing I would have told the younger version of me... No, I think the question was, would you have done something differently as the younger version of you? Okay. What I would have told myself is trust every experience that comes your way. Mm. because a lot of the times things happen and we just don't understand because my mum was one of my biggest champions and going into this next phase of my life without her even though I know she's my angel mm. but without her physically by my side is really I, I keep asking like why why are you not here mm. but then somebody said something recently and said your mum is has been elevated to become an angel so that you can become the woman that you were scared to be when she was around. Oh. And I, I listened to that and I thought that's actually true because a lot of times, even just going out and enjoying myself, I felt bad for it because I'm used to my mom calling me saying, where are you? As big as I was yes. 30 plus, whatever. It's so ingrained. I was still, it was ingrained. And so now I'm beginning to become the Elaine that I'm meant to be for this season because I have to be a particular Elaine to be able to drive down those doors. I'm trying to do big things. So, yeah, I have to be that. You Elaine. are doing big things, oh okay? Gosh. 
All right, I am going to ask you this one final question because as you were talking, I was like, okay, I, have, I think this would be such a beautiful place for us to mm-hmm. leave it. Your higher version is out there right now. So what's the future you telling you right now? Future me telling me right now. Mm. Future me is telling me right now that we made it. Oh, yes. We made it. We are on. And I'm a visual person as well. So you've got to be seeing me speaking on CNN. You've got to be see, seeing me on billboards. You've got to be seeing me. And not from a celebrity point of view, but as a change maker. Beautiful. You know, impacting. And I think that's the season I'm going into, impact. I'm going to end it there. Oh, I'm so here for it. <laughs> okay, so a quick fire round. I ask every single guest three questions. Okay. It could be something you've already said. doesn't need to be something new, but it's a really beautiful way to recap the episode. Okay, okay first question. A quote, whether it's yours or somebody else's, or food for thought that you want to leave our listeners with. Oh, my gosh. A quote. Or it can be food for thought. It doesn't have to be a quote. I think I'm going to take a scripture. Oh, okay, go for it. And the scripture says, whatever your hands find to do, do it as if you're doing it to God. So whatever you're doing, do it with excellence. I think that's what I would say to people. And excellent doesn't mean perfection. Excellence means just doing it higher than everybody else is doing it. I don't even want to ad lib. (laughs) Okay, next one. Practical tip that people can leave this episode with and go and do and implement into their life. Practical tip. Um... Have a plan, mm. write it down, five steps, stick to it, go for it. Oh, okay, last but not least, a book that you want to recommend, one that either has changed your life. Oh my gosh. A book from a friend. When I ask this question, I'm also really aware that not everybody loves to read. So if you want to do an audio book, also possible. Book. So I'm doing a lot of reading at the moment on racism in education. Okay. Um, and there's a book that I read called by Jeffrey Boache. I think it's called I Heard What You Said. Mm. Or I Know What You Said. I can't remember the title. I don't want to get it wrong. That's fine. I'm going to um, put it in the show notes. Yeah. Um, and that book talks about things that people say, unconscious biases that people have in, in, in education. Like things, <laughs> things that you look at now and you're like, that was actually a microaggression. Um, but yeah, I liked that book because it's where I am right now and I needed to read it as research. So yeah, that's that's the book that I think has changed my way of thinking about things. I mean, I've got so many books, I can't even pinpoint it's because right now. I've, yeah, I've put you on the spot, but I think that is a beautiful one and an interesting one for people to add to their book list. I am not going to say any more on that, otherwise it's going to open up a new episode, okay? <laughs> But I'm happy to come back for another episode. Okay, I'm just I'm trying to secure you now, okay? <laughs> I also want to say just the biggest thank you. Thanks. I hope it was worth getting stuck in traffic for. It was, definitely. I enjoyed it. It's I been an absolute it. pleasure. Thank you.